you. I, I want to uh, take a picture of my uh, audience. If uh, you get a chance to review the picture to see if you approve, uh, you, you you may. Oh, I can take another picture. It's all right. Just just uh, so when I get home, I can prove to people that I really did have have an audience. You know, they, sometimes they are suspicious. Uh, is Donald Trump's complaint. You know, they never show the audience. Right. Yeah. I have to. Okay. Good. Good. Um, I'll, I think I'll start. There's a, a nice video that my co-author Kyle made, which uh, it's not really introductory, but it sort of sets the uh, context for what we're doing. Let's see if I can make the... There's a speech thing. I, I wonder if can I, can I make it louder? Of course. Can you now check to see if either of these Irish firms have high outstanding debt, please? Just a bit. Still VJ. No, no, not that. I think this one. Okay. okay. Try again to play. Okay, I will. I'm also interested to see how many people are employed by Beck Sports. Make it go backwards a bit. Okay, this is usually people put demos at the end. But Hi, uh, I'm trying to find out some information about Irish companies in our database, if you can find any. He's looking for Irish companies in the database. And it's... Uh, can you now check to see if either of these Irish firms have high outstanding debt, please? High outstanding debt. And there's an answer. I'll explain this all better, but uh, this gives a setting. I'm also interested to see how many people are employed by Beck Sports. Beck Sports was one of the answers of the uh, previous query. The company. Can you now check to see if we have any clients who have decreasing daily sales outstanding? Decreasing daily sales outstanding. Now he's gotten a bunch with decreasing daily sales. This is, this is the end of the demo. I, uh, the, the beginning's more, more informative, but uh, we, can, we can play some of it again if we have time. Mm. Now let's find my actual talk, which is here. Okay, this is a talk about uh, natural uh, language access for, to data, and the argument is that we need to do some reasoning in order to be able to do this effectively. And it's joint work. Uh, uh, the I'm not a natural language person, but uh, Cleo Kondorovny at Stanford and Kyle Richardson at uh, Stuttgart did the uh, natural language and speech part. Uh, Asu uh, Sunbal at SAP did the business uh, 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 part and ha provided some uh, database expertise. And Vish Vishal Sika, who was at SAP and is now the uh, CEO of Infosys, was the initiator of the project and uh, you know, contributed oversight. The, uh, our problem is to access data from uh, structured data sources, so we're not getting text, we're looking at databases and things in columns and rows, and we're using natural language as our interface, so we don't, we don't have a GUI, we don't uh, have to uh, uh, type anything in logic, we uh, just ask questions in natural language. And this is a hard problem that we've only uh, uh, begun to attack. Uh, why is it hard? Well, one thing is that we're using a uh, uncontrolled natural language. So we're taking, we're getting anyone, anything in English uh, is a legal uh, query. Now we can't answer all of them, but uh, 
that's our goal, is to be able to handle uh, the relevant parts of uh, English as an input. And we're not uh, just doing what Google does in providing websites which might contain the answer. We're trying to really find out what the answer is. So uh, we're being very specific. We're uh, finding answers that may not be explicitly in any of the databases we're accessing, but might need to be deduced or computed from uh, pieces of information provided by each uh, database. And we're dealing with um, uh, sequences of queries. So in addition to, uh, we don't just handle a, a one-shot query, we uh, do a query, we get some answers, and then we realize, oh, we didn't really ask exactly what we wanted, or we wanted a little bit more information, or we want to restrict the question some. So we add on to the question and expect it to uh, uh, build on what it's already done. So uh, it's not starting from scratch. But to make the problem more tractable, we uh, restrict ourselves to particular domains. We're not answering questions about uh, anything and everything. And in the case of the system I'll, I'm talking about, we're uh, uh, you are working in a business enterprise domain. And uh, that uh, is, uh, we, could, we could do other domains too, but we would have to know something about the domain before we can answer questions in it. And also, we are accessing previously known databases. So we're not going out on uh, to the web and finding new databases that might be relevant. We're, we know what databases we have for our domain, and we have links to those databases. In the, uh, the uh, system I'm talking about, which is called Quest, we're accessing uh, uh, the HANA database, which was uh, the primary database of the, of the SAP company. and um, uh, uh, multiple other other auxiliary databases get uh, get accessed in the way. Now this is uh, the last in a series of projects using similar technologies where we're using deductive methods to answer questions. Uh, perhaps the earliest was the Amphion system, which was done with NASA for uh, answering questions in planetary astronomy. There we were not dealing with uh, natural language inputs. We were uh, we used a graphical sort of a pictorial interface to uh, pose the question. There was biodeducta, which is a uh, for molecular biology, and that used a uh, logical uh, representation. But then there was quark, which was for uh, intelligence applications involving uh, geographical reasoning, and that was, uh, that had a natural language interface. And most recently, quadri, which was for medical database access done with people uh, Stanford Biomedical Informatics. So in the, in the business domain we're talking about, the questions that we're looking, about, looking at look something like this. They're involved in, a, in an area where we're, we have a company uh, such as SAP, which has many clients, and some of them may be behind in paying their bills. We want to find which ones are behind, how far behind are they, how long have they had this uh, outstanding debt, are they showing signs of recovery, uh, uh, how big are they? Uh, so, which ones are more more of a c concern? We, uh, something, something that we might be alarmed about. So here, here we start with a question: find a company with a long-term debt within the last two years. We then, then after seeing the answers, we say, oh, we're only interested in ones with a debt more than five million euros. And then, oh, we say, oh, we're really only interested in Swiss companies. So we add that on after we see the results from the previous queries and uh, get a new uh, set of uh, answers. So the uh, people who are not reasoning people will ask, well, why do you need reasoning to do this? Why can't you just compile the question into SQL and be done with it? And the, there are many reasons why reasoning is uh, crucial. Uh, the query itself might be logically complex. It might involve constructs, not just, it's not just conjunctions of, uh, of conditions, it's, uh, they might have uh, uh, and, or, not, and uh, quantifiers. We, uh, English is famously, famously ambiguous. For some of our queries, we, uh, uh, if we just parse it syntactically, we can get over 700 different uh, parses, interpretations for that sentence. 
But if we know some subject domain knowledge, which is encoded in an axiomatic theory, we can throw uh, away almost all of those interpretations. Uh, so if you know something about the domain, uh, English becomes much less ambiguous. Just people seem to manage to understand it pretty well. Uh, it's uh, uh, only a problem if you don't know what the person's talking about to start with. Um, then, of course, there's a difference between the vocabulary of the person formulating the question and the vocabulary uh, adopted by the various databases. Like, we might ask a question about client when the database talks about company or something like that. And uh, the, someone has to know that they mean the same thing in this context. So there can be also uh, other kinds of inferential links between the uh, uh, question and what information is provided by the various databases that we're concerned with. So it's not a straightforward match. And also, when the databases come back with their answers, these answers need to be composed uh, uh, into uh, uh, the answer the person was asking about, and that involves some reasoning too. So our approach is deductive. We uh, start with a, uh, a query, and we that first goes undergoes uh, semantic parsing, so it gets translated into a semantic representation. This is a structure that parsers produce. Uh, uh, it's pre pretty standardized. It's not uh, mathematical logic, but it's uh, very structured. And it's a straightforward transformation to translate into a logical formula. That logical formula we view as a theorem, and we submit that theorem to a theorem prover to be proved. The theorem prover uh, has a capability for extracting answers from proofs. So if the theorem is proved, the, there also is a mechanism for saying, oh, that means that this, 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 and this are answers to that, to that query. And uh, the uh, theory, is, so the proof is conducted in, in the axiomatic theory, which provides our domain knowledge. Uh, it also contains links uh, symbols in the theory are linked to uh, tables in various databases. So we know that this uh, symbol in the logical theory, this uh, predicate symbol or function symbol, is uh, related to a row in a certain table in this, in this database, and we can go and look it up. So the Quest system that I'm talking about uh, originally uh, used natural language produced by uh, PAR. We used the PAR parser, but eventually we uh, rewrote it both to streamline it and to uh, um, um, make the intellectual property be free. So uh, uh, the, new, the new parser is called parse, uh, SAPL. The reasoning is done by uh, uh, the theorem prover SNARK, which was uh, written by the late Mark Stickle at SRI. It's a very mature uh, uh, first order logic reasoning system with uh, special capabilities I'll talk about. The data mostly came from HANA, as I said, but there were also special purpose databases like for currency conversion, uh, geographical information about nationalities, and so forth. So SNARK is, well, basically it's a first order logic resolution theorem for full, full first order logic, doesn't have to be uh, foreign clauses or or uh, restricted in any way. And it has facilities for dealing with equality, so you can, uh, it has rewriting and paramodulation. The, um, uh, it operates on a sorted theory, so you can uh, assign sorts or types to symbols in the theory, and it uh, will know that that symbol stands for something of that type. It has the answer extraction mechanism that I talked about, which is fairly common in theorem provers for pulling answers out of proofs. Um, and it has, uh, what's more unusual is the procedural attachment mechanism, which is the mechanism for linking, linking uh, a symbol in the theory to the uh, external database. And, the, uh, and it also has special facilities for uh, spatial and uh, temporal reasoning. Not uh, The spatial isn't quite as good as we saw this morning, but it, uh, it has uh, uh, things like uh, RCC8, and it has the Allen integral calculus, it has data arithmetic, and uh, the things that you don't want to do by axioms, you want to be able to do a computation to uh, um, do 
those. So the uh, the uh, the theory, mo uh, m much of the knowledge of the theory is embedded in the axiomatic subject uh, axiomatic subject domain uh, uh, theory, and uh, so that defines the concepts uh, in our queries. What what uh, the, uh, when the person asks a question, what does that symbol mean? It expresses the capabilities of the databases. So it's like specifications for the databases that we uh, know about. It uh, provides background knowledge that relates the uh, uh, conditions of the query to the uh, knowledge stored in the various databases. And it also includes a, a sort or type structure which is roughly uh, equivalent to an ontology. But uh, the other... Uh, so it, it's uh, basically it's a list of axioms plus an ontology. And here is uh, some of the sort structure. Uh, we have entities, which include agents, which include companies. And we have uh, time intervals, which include debts. We regard a debt as a temporal object because it has a starting and an ending point. It has numbers, which include uh, things like money and sizes of companies and stuff like that. And a number of other things that... Uh, come up countries and so forth. Now, when we have a symbol in the theory, the, uh, the symbol is declared as to what types of arguments it expects. So like there's a relation company has debt. Maybe I can use my thing. This, the first argument of company has debt is company. The second argument is of sort debt. So it, these are the expected sorts of the arguments where company has debt. Similarly, company has size. Its first argument is of sort company. Its second of argu argument is of sort size, which is a kind of number. And then there are temporal relations, like the within relation holds between two time intervals, but not between uh, agents, say, unless they have to be temporal. And uh, something like nationality applies to agents. So we can talk about a, a Swiss a Swiss uh, company, but we don't talk about a Swiss debt, say, because it's not, uh, it's not an agent. I mean, one could write theories where, this, where these are different, but this is the way it is in this particular theory. So the parsing, as I said, was originally based on PARC. There were uh, combined XLE, which was purely syntactic, and Bridge, which added semantic information. And, uh, and, and that's been taken over into SAPL, which was specifically written for Quest. And the parser is informed by the sort structure or the ontology. So it knows what relations um, are, uh, what the sorts for each relation are. And that is what allows it to throw away a lot of the uh, meaningless parses that the uh, parser might produce if it was not, not equipped with uh, semantic information. So uh, here's an example uh, we start with an uh, English query, show a company with a high debt within the last two years. And this structure, which I won't uh, go into uh, too much, is the semantic representation produced by the parser. So this is similar to what, uh, what Park produced. It's similar to what the Stanford parser produces, and it's similar to what, and, and it's exactly what SAPL produces. And it, uh, one thing it does, which is, uh, important for us is that it highlights which variables are existentially quantified. It gives the scoping of the variables and uh, what, uh, which variables scope over what relations in the query. So the uh, debt goes over the, the company has debt relation, for example. So from this, it is a mechanical process to go into the logical form, which is a, a theorem in uh, first order logic, which uh, uh, captures the relevant parts of the query. So in this case, we're looking for a company, we're looking for a debt, and we're looking for uh, a time interval. The time interval, which is the uh, not-so-straightforward thing, is uh, an interval which ends at the time now when the question is being asked, and is two years long. Uh, so we, we say that the company has debt is a relation that holds between the company and the debt, the debt is within this two-year time interval, and the, the time interval is last, which means it ends now. That's, that's a, uh, the way we say it ends now. Now is not really 
now, this minute, it's, uh, there's a fictitious time that we're asking the question. I forget whether it's 2007 or something like that. We'll see. When we, after we get the logical form, we translate it back into English and play it in for, back to the user in a kind of a, this is a very uh, stylized, uh, pedantic kind of English, but it's unambiguous. So the uh, person reading it can see how their sentence has been understood. And if uh, there's some misunderstanding, which is possible, the person can uh, intervene and say, oh, no, I didn't mean that, and, and uh, rephrase their question to try to get it understood properly. Uh, in, in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, perfectly good, but uh, you wouldn't expect the person to produce this by themselves, but they can read it, even without knowing logic, they can read it and uh, uh, see if it um, has something to do with what they originally intended to say. So the axioms in the theory express the, uh, give the meaning of the concepts in the query. So, like, we might want to know what do we mean by a high debt? You know, that's something that's uh, could be different for one person to another. The, the system has its own its own idea of what a, a debt is, which is uh, uh, something that's more than a million dollars, which is like an arbitrary selected thing that uh, uh, we. And that's expressed by this axiom. The uh, 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 so the the debt is high if it's. Uh, if its uh, money amount is greater than $1 million. And high might be different for other kinds of things, like uh, you know, whether it's a, a high profit might be a different number. The, um, now, uh, uh, a relation like company has debt is explained in terms of internal uh, symbols in the theory, like uh, uh, there's a, a, a theory called company record, which uh, is actually has a procedural attachment to a table in the HANA database. So this is uh, the, the uh, relation which says everything we know about each company in the database. There's some 800 companies, and so it knows for each of those companies, it knows the, uh, uh, what its debt is, it knows its location, its size, its daily sales outstanding, that Kyle talked about in the video. And so forth. Uh, so it can look up information, uh, including now this this number debt uh, uh, could be zero or um, or uh, negative, depending on depending on what um, uh, what the record of that company is. But we require for to say that a company has debt, we require that it has a positive debt. So if a company has zero debt, we say it doesn't have a debt at all. It's paid off all its bills. If a company has a negative debt, it's actually uh, has a credit, so it's paid paid in advance and uh, is uh, uh, you wouldn't count it as having a debt at all. So so this this relation company record uh, lets us go out into the uh, into the uh, database and see what we know about that company. And here's a an example of uh, what we know about one of those companies, SL Foods. It's just part of it. Uh, it says that this. Uh, it, it has a debt, which is this huge, huge number. This is in dollars. Its location is given by a, uh, uh, a two-character uh, two code. And we know the start date of the, of the debt. And there's a, uh, uh, many, many columns in this uh, database about various information that uh, it knows about SL, SL Foods. This is all fictionalized, by the way. Uh, uh, SAP only scrambled all the data before they before they gave it to us, so they wouldn't be revealing any uh, private client information. So, it this says CH stands for Switzerland, and it, so it thinks that CH is in Switzerland. I looked up SL Foods, and it's actually in Los Angeles. So, you can't believe everything you read in the data. <coughs> um, uh, but anyway, this this shows that uh, there's some transformation that needs to be done. Like, CH, is, uh, the person doesn't ask about CH, they may ask about Swiss companies or Switzerland, but someone has to know that CH stands for Switzerland, and the database doesn't tell you that itself. Uh, someone else tells you there's a, a separate database for two, two character codes, which uh, says that CH is Switzerland, and then someone else has to tell you that Switzerland and Swiss are related, which is easy enough for Switzerland, but there are some other, other countries where uh, the uh, words are quite different. Um, 
the uh, uh, so anyway, so th so this is like what what it gets from the from the database. So I, I I'm not going through the, the the proof for the answer, but when we get the answer, we go through and say why everything that's in the answer uh, satisfies uh, what was requir required in the query. So it, it we have that the the debt is within this two-year time interval. Here's now, uh, September 1st, 2008. Um, uh, it says that that duration is indeed two years, and, uh, uh, the, uh, and the, the end point of this interval is, la is now, so this is a, a last interval, and the debt is really high. Now, uh, I said that we need uh, reasoning for a variety, variety of things, including resolving ambiguity. Now, here is part of why uh, we need to uh, uh, resolve ambiguity. We, um, we, the query says, show me a client with a high debt, and then it goes on and uh, we add on to the query, it was within the last two years, or we say it must be within the last two years, or we want it to be within the last two years. Well, uh, what does it mean? We have pronouns, and we're unrestricted English, so it's not controlled English. It could could be the client, it could be the debt. But uh, if we know that within uh, is a temporal quantity, uh, that means that uh, it must be a temporal object. Debt is a temporal object, client is not a temporal object. So this has to be, it is unambiguous because, uh, in, if you have that domain knowledge, because it has to be the debt, has to be a temporal object. On the other hand, if you say instead, it should be Swiss, I want it to be, I want, I want a Swiss company. It cannot be the debt because uh, 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 debts don't have nationalities. Uh, so it has to be the client. Client is an agent, client doesn't have nationality. So we can disambiguate the uh, uh, pronoun, which would otherwise have been ambiguous, by uh, resorting to the sort knowledge, which is uh, built into the theory. Um, there are still cases where you can write ambiguous queries, and in that case, we just answer both questions and let the person choose which one they like best. That's well, <coughs> maybe not, not optimal, but that's uh, a qu quick way of doing it. Okay, here's, uh, here's an example. Another reason why we want to, uh, this is oozing, um, another reason we want to be able to have logical reasoning in our in our process is that the query itself might have logical operators such as negation, disjunction, or quantifier. So here, here's a, a question, which clients do not have a high debt? And um, so, we, uh, so we have a, a negation in the, in the query. Does it show up here? Yeah, maybe I can get it to, oh, it's, it's, it doesn't move exactly the way I expected. Anyway, here's here's a knot in the in the query, and uh, it uh, uh, so you, you you have to be able to deal with knot in your logic in order to uh, um, in order to uh, answer the question properly. Let's see what we have next. So here's here's uh, we play back the uh, uh, query and. Um, How do you turn it on? Ah, good. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Um, so uh, th this is the playback where we, we say it is not so that the company has debt and the debt is high. So it could be, it could be two ways that this could happen. Uh, it could be that either the uh, the company does not have a debt, uh, which can happen because uh, it has a, a zero in its balance, for example. Or it could be that it does have a debt, but the debt is not high. So it has a medium debt or a low debt. debt. So it needs reasoning to be able to uh, realize that both those things are possible ways of not having a debt. And for this particular example, one thing it, uh, it uh, relies on is domain knowledge uh, that in, the, in this context, the debt means the debt the company owes SAP. So it is uh, a unique number at any one time. It's a unique number. So uh, if, a, if we say that the company has a debt uh, 
and we say somewhere else that the company has uh, another debt, debt two, it must be the case that debt one and debt two are the same. So uh, what this tells us is that if we find a company, we're looking for something that does not have a high debt. Say we find a company that has a low debt, we need to reason that that company does not also have a high debt. But we can use this axiom to conclude that because debts are unique. So if it has a low debt, it does not have a high debt. So it, so it's a sati it satisfies the query. And this is something that piece of cake for a theorem prover, but uh, it might not be so easy for a compiler. Um, so like for, for, so for this negation, uh, negation question, we get uh, uh, two of the companies we get are An Wang, which has a, a relatively low debt, or the world distribution of something or other, which has a zero debt, so it has no, does not have a debt. Both of these, both of these satisfy the, the negation problem. And um, uh, so, uh, so we get, we get companies with no debt, companies with a small debt, or companies with a medium debt in our answers. How were this uh, high and low established? Well, high was defined by the axiom I showed before, which was mil more than a million dollars. Uh, and then there was a, there's another axiom for for low, which is less than uh, I don't know, hundred thousand or something like that. And then there's this medium, which says it's uh, not high or low. <laughs> so. Uh, Right, yeah, but it's arbitrary. You could change it if you, yeah. if you wanted to. Um, so uh, then we can also use the reasoning capability to ask ask general questions about uh, about debt, which don't actually require looking things up in the database at all. Like, like if we ask, is it the case that no company has a negative debt? We can say yes right away without looking at the database. Because our definition for uh, a company that has a debt is that it, its debt is, uh, is uh, that number is positive. So, and uh, we have an axiom which says that a number, or we can prove that it, uh, a, a debt can be, uh, can't be both positive and negative. So we can uh, uh, answer, answer yes to that question without, without ever uh, needing to uh, uh, look up any uh, go through all the companies. So uh, that is our um, uh, roughly a, a description of what the what the system does uh, currently. We we uh, worked for uh, I think less than a year on this under SAP support, and then when uh, Vishal Sika left to uh, join Emphasis, the uh, project was discontinued. It was kind of his particular he uh, particularly championed the project. And there were other things we meant to do uh, that we have not had time to uh, uh, to get to. For example, um, we uh, one bottleneck is uh, uh, the forming forming the axioms in the axiomatic theory. Uh, this is a time-consuming process. It requires knowledge of the subject domain, and it requires. Uh, knowledge of logic to write things in logic. And uh, so there are f you know, a few people who know both of those things. We can, we can build, build uh, teams of them, which is what we do. We, like for business, we don't know what the business domain, but we had people from SAP who helped us, gave us, gave us advice. Um, but well, how do we extend this? How do, what is the way of uh, uh, making this uh, a bigger, uh, you know, ma making a bigger, a bigger knowledge source and extending it to new areas. And one thing, uh, like the system currently will translate queries into uh, theorems, but the same technology uh, with some modification could also translate declarative English sentences into uh, axiomatic form. And there are, there are people who are, are uh, doing some of this already. So we can imagine a system which lets a domain expert who doesn't know English formulate a, uh, uh, or extend an axiomatic uh, uh, theory simply by saying, uh, saying uh, declarative sentences explaining the concepts in the domain. It would be like writing a very pedantic and maybe boring textbook where you're explaining to someone who knows nothing about the theory what, uh, what are the uh, um, concepts of the theory. And then to test it, they would uh, ask questions um, 
which, uh, uh, well, if you know this and this, we expect you to be able to answer this question. And if it doesn't answer this question, then the person has to go back and uh, see whatever, what information is missing that uh, is necessary for it to, uh, uh, it to answer that question. So it's a, an incremental process. It, it, it's still time consuming, but it can be done by someone with no, with no knowledge of logic or programming. A, a simple domain expert, and also we could in, uh, have a team of domain of domain experts collaborating in uh, developing this uh, 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 this theory. And if there are inconsistencies introduced, uh, since different people will have different interpretations for words and uh, uh, different uh, um, explanations of their different ex different background assumptions. Uh, the theorem prover itself can detect inconsistencies. That's what that's what theorem provers do best. They look for inconsistencies. That's how it's a, uh, like snark is a reputation procedure. It's always negating what it's trying to prove and trying to find inconsistencies in the result. So it can come back and uh, uh, show these. Uh, okay, you domain expert over here said this. You domain expert over here said this. Those are inconsistent. Uh, how do you reconcile it? Now, it won't know how to reconcile it itself, but it will uh, 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 sort of encourage the domain experts to come to some consensus. Uh, and they don't even have to know each other. It could be, could be done, done uh, remotely. Um, there are other... Uh, okay, so th this is what I, what I just was saying. There are uh, other things... Uh, in the SAP domain, we were heading towards analytic questions that could help help a decision maker uh, you know, access data to, that would influence uh, business business decisions. We the spoken in, uh, input that I showed you was uh, done by just attaching a standard Google speech uh, package in front of the text uh, system, and uh, uh, so it's not terribly uh, rugged, like if you talk about debt, it might think you mean death. You know, uh, we, we don't talk about debt in, in, in our subject domain, so if you should be able to use the same techniques we have before in uh, uh, getting the speech interface to throw out, uh, to throw out things about uh, death, but uh, so far, so far it uh, seems to it works surprisingly well, considering that it doesn't have any semantic knowledge and at the speech level. Only, only when it gets to text does it, does it uh, have semantic knowledge. We've, we've sort of been blithe about efficiency concerns, which are crucial. And if we go to large databases, they tend to be semantic a little bit. Uh, uh, for the uh, medical domain, we had like 50,000 patients. And that was beginning to strain it. And like, we would expect to be able to, like if we took a particular language like SQL, we could try to generate efficient SQL queries rather than just uh, lots of primitive SQL queries. And uh, we want to um, uh, automate the uh, introduction of new databases, so making new procedural attachments to symbols. So we have a, we find a new symbol, uh, you find a new database, you introduce a symbol that's going to correspond to that database, and you want to uh, make it make it fast to, uh, the person has to say what, what the things mean, but it, uh, it should be done with someone who has no knowledge about programming or logic to, to do it. And um, so I thought, uh, do I, oh, I, there's a, a paper in uh, the AAA's AI Spring Symposium from 2015 on uh, common sense reasoning, and that uh, uh, has some of uh, much of the stuff in, in about the system, and uh, I thought I would show. Let me go back and get Kyle's uh, video up again, and we can uh, see a bit more of it. Well, why don't I? It's a little small, so maybe I'll read some of it. Hi, Quest. Can you give me 
a list of SAP clients from our database. And now it oh, I'm, I'm blocking somebody, right? So it comes up with a, with a list of clients, and then it... Uh, it so then uh, it wants more information about big uh, about big sports. So it says, in particular, I'm interested in uh, Beck Sports. Can you pull up a? Did, it, did I step on something? Is it going? First, the egg. <laughs> First, the egg by Laura, by Laura Vaccaro Seeger. First, the egg, eh? <laughs> That must have been. Hmm. How are we for time? See the logical form in English. We don't show logic for most of the users. Um, and so it's, it's found that exports are similar to the Irish, and uh, it says what the about the firm with the largest number of employees. So it can, to do this it needs to find uh, the proofs of all the, uh, all the companies and um, uh, compare them to see which is, which are the highest. Uh, but, um, the, the highest number of employees is good. Now I'm interested in large American Say owe money instead of have a debt. It knows it knows that uh, owing money and having a debt are the same thing. It's just against what we think in the theory. But the first style of the answer is not the entertaining. Can you find that within that list an American firm that? owes SAP debt totaling more than uh, 1,000 euros. Oh, uh, the, the thing about euros is that um, the, the database is in, is in dollars, US dollars, so it needs to do currency conversion on the, um, uh, on the, the figure, so, so, it's a, the, uh, the, so it has to convert, convert the number of debts into euros. Um, and it has a, uh, web, there's a website which gives, uh, every day gives a new currency table for 35 different currencies. Uh, so it, look, it goes to this database and looks at, now it turns out that, uh, that we only, for this particular application, we are only interested in this one date, the, the date now is uh, December 1st, 2009. So, uh, we only look at that date, but in general we could ask questions that involve uh, 
what's going to be done to you soon, I guess. So at least the ones that are in that uh, uh, database will ask historical questions about about Francis. about time, which I sort of, I sort of showed, uh, it has the full analytical calculation of the, the, the nodes, the nodes of our states, as in how many, how many days it is, and it knows that um, 19 seconds, so that's one way. Okay. Um, the, the nationality of Here's a, a general question, similar to the one I showed in the, in the uh, talk. Uh, could it happen that a company's debt is both high and low? And uh, it says yes. It, yes, it could not happen. that some company has no outstanding debt. So it finds one is higher than two. It actually finds two. Maybe one is zero and one is uh, negative eight. And then here's the part we saw. So I... Uh, so, so now he's turning into... Hi, uh, I'm trying to find out some information about Irish companies in our database, if you can find any. One, one thing I didn't show, which if I can get Quest to actually work, would be interesting, is uh, I'd like to show a, a truly ambiguous question. So, show a company with a debt, and I say, it is large. Now this, this is truly ambiguous because large is defined for both companies. You can have large companies and you can have large debts. So let's, I don't want to, it's text, right? Um, it is ambiguous. It could be a convention. It could be a convention. It's the last one of the alternatives that are allowed. It could be, but uh, uh, in this case, it uh, it uh, doesn't know, uh, or it doesn't it doesn't have that convention, and what it does is it actually produces two different translations. Here it talks about uh, the uh, the debt is equal to. Entity seven, and entity seven is a thing that is large. So in this in this interpretation, it's uh, saying that uh, the uh, the thing that you uh, the it entity seven is the debt, and it gives some answers for that. But then here it uh, uh, it says entity where is it? Entity seven is company five. So here entity seven is uh, is the company rather than the debt. And we get a different a different set of answers for that for that case. So since it doesn't know, instead of asking the user uh, which one did you mean, it just goes ahead and answers both and uh, um, lets the user choose which one. It, uh, it probably should probably should alert the user to the fact that its question was ambiguous. But uh, that's a question. Uh, we could try it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether uh, everything you say is handled because this is still work in progress. So it's. Uh, uh, so it's show me a company with a debt 
w which is largely which or that I forget. <laughs> I have uh, in another window. I have. Internal workings, so we can see what it's doing. If I can find it, it's an Emacs. Here it is. Oh, it's doing something. Oh, it it, uh, it looks as if it forgot all about the bar. It, it didn't understand it. It, it no. didn't. Do the, it didn't understand the relative the relative the construction. It, it's a it's a it, it dropped it dropped the witch because it, it didn't understand uh, what it meant, so it, it, you know, it ignored it. So it was just showing companies now. It, it's a flaw in the system. It's not. No, it's a per Yeah, I, I guess for uh, in this case, which is large, you would expect it to be the debt. But it, uh, since it's uh, that would be uh, well, like that uh, earlier suggestion had it be the last one that it, that sounds like English to me that you wish it, but it, it didn't it didn't handle it. So does it does it engage in dialogue? No, um, that would that would be that would, that would be a natural that would be a natural thing to uh, try to see which one the person really meant, especially if there are a lot of them, but. Um, but uh, what it does is just goes goes ahead and uh, answers all of them. You can argue that it's less irritating to the user having it uh, have, uh, not asking too many questions. Are there any more questions? No, that's a sort. That's a sort thing. Uh, agent is declared. Uh, uh, companies are declared to be agents. Nationality is declared to take an agent as an argument, um, and uh, it uh, has a disjointness between um, agents and. I think. I think it has. Uh, uh, at any rate, it does not uh, uh, have have uh, Swiss. Uh, Debts. It only has Swiss Swiss companies. Any other questions? Well, uh, governors of the day don't seem to speak in complete sentences anymore. So they're, they're used to uh, texting and tweeting just sort of phrases with a lot of abbreviation uh, and smiley faces. Okay, okay. Well, How do you handle the tweet like that? All right, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> a. Let's see, a, a Swiss company with a large debt. I know there's one of those. So. This is not, not a sentence, right? Let's see what it's doing. It's found a theorem. It's proved the theorem, and it come, came back with two companies SO food and candy corporate. The, the um, so it doesn't it doesn't actually require uh, sentences. It uh, it pulls some meaning out of whatever whatever it does find. And that was true. Like the uh, the park parser in which this is based was used to parse the uh, entire uh, Wikipedia, which you know they have said most of those are sentences, but you know it, it has to be pretty rugged to be able to do that. It doesn't it doesn't actually. Uh, throw up its hands very often. It tries to do something out of every sentence it finds. Now, sometimes it may do the wrong thing, but it uh, tries to just pull, pull meaning out of what it, what's there. Okay. Questions? Okay, so maybe I can ask my question. Ah, sure. uh, it's about the vocabulary. Uh, yeah. Uh, you described earlier how you can uh, infer some disambiguates or concepts depending on the, the uh, characteristics of some of the attributes. 
I can, but what about if you have the same name, the same concept, which has two different meanings in different contexts, uh, so same, same concept, different meaning, different context. Uh -huh. For example, a small debt for a certain, for example, there could be different uh, context of for a debt, for example, a, a long-standing debt uh, could be large, even if it's uh, maybe half a million. Could there be a way to disambiguate something that is called in the same way, debt, but means different things, maybe in different uh, business uh, you know, areas, for example? Well, uh, it depends on what you mean by uh, how big a context you can have. Like what, what we do now, like large, we could have large company or we could have large debt, but it knows uh, the sort of the arguments so it can tell. So that's a kind of a context because uh, it knows uh, whether this is a company or a debt and, can, and it has different definitions for, for, each, for each one. But uh, it could be that uh, there are some... Like in, in our particular context, uh, debt's unique, like because uh, uh, we're talking only about debts between um, uh, uh, between uh, uh, companies and SAP. We so it's current debt, but you know, in, in life, people have many debts to many different people, and if you were to, uh, extending it, you would uh, uh, not have that axiom. So this axiom has to apply only to a sub-theory, which is like this SAP <laughs> debt sub-theory. And uh, one can do that. There are ways of combining theories so that uh, even though you use the same word, it uh, has an invisible prefix saying what the sub-theory is. So this is SAP colon debt, uh, and it has the axiom holds for SAP colon debt, and there's a more general concept of debt. Uh, the axiom does not hold for the more general. Yeah, the theory. Yeah, I wanted to classify debt as a type of time interval. Yes. From a, a certain perspective, I would call that a categorical error. That a debt is some, something that happens, not, and it's not a time interval. Um, but in this context, it seems to work just fine. It, ha it has a temporal, it, it's not just a time interval, it, have, it has other other things besides the time interval, but you could talk about the start time of a, of a debt just as you could talk about the start time of any other temporal object. Mm -hmm. But it has other other attributes, too. It, it's, the sort it's is not unique. Sort of object-oriented approach rather than a philosophical approach, perhaps. If you like. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, so I have a Did you find yourself wishing for uh, expressiveness Oh, yeah, yeah, all of those, I think. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, certainly higher order. We, we uh, use the uh, usual trick of reification because the parser will produce higher order things which we then uh, translate into first order. Uh, like we say, apply large company becomes large of company, uh, things like that. Because <coughs> the, uh, the parser doesn't, doesn't mind doing higher order things and snark, snark objects. There seems to be a close match between this high order of syntax and the more parser of objects. Right. And of, of course, probabilistic, you know, there is some, some knowledge which is not certain, and uh, rules of thumb, or you know, more, um, by, by and large, companies that have high debt are risky investments, but maybe not, you know, uh, uh, thing, things like that. So we, we, we have to draw a hard line. You know, just even. Even uh, large and small, that's a, a, a typically fuzzy logic kind of thing, and we just make a hard decision. This bigger than a million is large, 999, whatever it is, it's going to be a medium, you know, it's like, uh, and 99 cents, it's still medium, it's only, only that penny that makes it flip the thing. And so it's sort of, it's sort of artificial. So there are many things that we could, we could uh, um, take advantage of, but we're just doing one project. Thank you, uh, our keynote speaker, Richard Martin.